what broke him down? Was it just Constantly the pressure? body punches. When I was, I was hitting him with body punches, I heard him actually, he was crying in there, making woman gestures like, oh, oh, oh. Welcome back to Classic Boxing Recaps here on BLTV Extra. My reputation is immortal. Being the youngest champion, that's immortal. In today's video, we'll be rewinding the clock back to 1987, the peak of Iron Mike Tyson's career, while revisiting a particularly hostile and hate-filled grudge match rarely spoken of today. Oh, he's been talking a lot. He's been talking a lot. He's been talking a lot. He's gonna be so, so nice for him. Unquestionably, Tyson was an emotional loose cannon during, well, pretty much most of his career. Nevertheless, he was seldomly disrespectful to the men he shared the ring with. That was until Terrell Biggs turned up, a six foot five undefeated Olympic gold medalist that had respected pundits such as Sugar Ray Leonard, Larry Merchant, and Angelo Dundee convinced his Muhammad Ali-esque style might be enough to put a stop to the Tyson train. Well, I personally feel that uh, Tyra Biggs possessed the tools, the physical tools, to be effective against a fight like Mike Tyson. If you enjoy the content on this channel, a thumbs up is always appreciated. Without any further ado, meet the man who tried to rope-a-dope Iron Mike. And as good as I am, I know that I, I know how good I am. You know, I owe it to myself to go out there and beat Michael Tyson like I am his dad. It's, he's made for me. Tyson, son, son, son. While Mike Tyson and Terrell Biggs are two polar opposites when it comes to fighting styles, both of the American heavyweights did share one key factor, the desire to reach the pinnacle of the heavyweight division at an early age while still being in the preliminary stages of their career. The opportunity to prove myself into the world, not only am I the youngest champion in the world, which people think is a joke and funny, I really believe deep down that I'm the best. Unsurprisingly, Tyson's amateur career was centered around fear, explosive skill, and punching power all traits instilled by the legendary coach Custom Auto and his hands-on apprentice, Teddy Atlas. While the impressive style served the then 16-year-old Tyson well, fight fans with a keen eye could tell his kryptonite would likely be a slick boxer with experience and durability. However, such tests would be put on standby in 1985 once Iron Mike turned pro, being carefully matched under Cus's guidance, who for the most part matched his prodigy with a long list of journeymen that beforehand had been used predominantly as Tyson's sparring partners in preparation for the professional ring. You know, I could fight on the outside or on the inside. While Tyson's beat-em-up style was clearly designed for the pros, his future opponent, Terrell Biggs, was carving out a stellar amateur career while taking the classic hit-and-not-get-hit approach. Of the shape. Biggs taller, Biggs with the reach, Biggs quick, much faster. The way Biggs fights, quick-footed, quick-handed fighter, very much so for a heavyweight, excellent left jab. Big's athletic background dates back to his high school days, where he was once considered a ball prospect to be mentioned alongside Magic Johnson as he finished his school term with a basketball record of 63-1. and Many of his teammates at the time, one of which being Gene Banks, went on to have successful careers in the NBA. Biggs, on the other hand, post-school, decided to apply his physical advantages to the sweet science and quickly became the most decorated heavyweight amateur in America, winning a multitude of tournaments globally, eventually beating Lennox Lewis en route to becoming the Olympic champion in 1984. Before Biggs' pro career took off, the former Philadelphian street kid booked himself into a local drug rehabilitation center to cure his, at the time, outrageous $1,500 a day crack cocaine addiction. And that's when I made my mind and I said, well, I, you know, I can use this. This, can, this is what's going to get me back in order. Overcoming addiction was just part of the problem. To the dismay of the crowd, Big's amateur style, despite being a winning formula, lacked any real urgency or excitement, and after 10 or so fights, he was close to being cut off TV altogether. Lou Duva, the manager of Terrell, and a handful of other 1984 medalists persisted on his heavyweight prodigy dropping his box and move style to elect for a more fan-friendly mall and brawl approach. And while it worked in the sense of creating interest for a world title fight, it limited Big's ring generalship, with his next fights against Ronaldo Snipes and David Bay being labored and unnecessarily punishing. Tyrell Biggs has changed his style of boxing, now has become a fair puncher. Puncher, 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 puncher. Distracted before he got punched. Against the left, he's in against the left. The left hand. At the other end of the spectrum, the boxing world couldn't get enough of Tyson. 
The Teenage Dynamo was on the front cover of every magazine. Gaming companies were offering a fortune to license his name, and TV show hosts were queuing up to have him on their late night sofa. It's worth bearing in mind, Mike wasn't even a world champion at this point, yet a streak of destructive performances captured the imagination of millions globally. There is electricity in the crowd. I've got goosebumps. Once Tyson got his shot at the WBC title in 1986, the world tuned in, expecting a demolition job regardless of who was defending the title. In this case, it was the Jamaican Trevor Burbick, and he never stood a chance. I knew when I, when I came to this fight, I was the best fighter in the world, and not a man alive that can beat me. Tyson improved his record to 31-0 over the next year, defeating Bone Crusher Smith and Tony Tucker to unify the division. And that is when Terrell Biggs entered the frame. One thing seems abundantly clear. Mike Tyson is in a fighting mood. To put it bluntly, Tyson hated Biggs. Their feud dates back to the amateur days when the U.S. Olympic Boxing Committee chose Biggs to represent America at L.A. 1984, as opposed to Tyson, who would have been the fan's choice between the two even back then. Biggs did win the gold, to be fair, yet that wasn't the reason for Tyson's prolonged grudge. According to Mike Tyson's book, Undisputed Truth, Terrell dissed him in 1984 when Tyson came to wish the American boxing team good luck before they boarded the flight to L.A. The exact words exchanged are unknown, although it was along the lines of Biggs laughing in his face while asking him, how are you getting home? Alluding to Tyson not boarding the plane because he was not chosen to represent his country. It may sound petty to the majority of you guys watching today, but remember, Tyson was still a kid at this point, and a large part of his teenage years were spent working towards the Olympic dream. Biggs became the face that reminded him of defeat and failure, and for that, anything short of brutal revenge wouldn't put the demons to rest. Thanks to the guys at the Boxing Hall of Fame Las Vegas YouTube channel, we can now view a detailed timeline of Mike Tyson's preparation for this fight. And goodness me, to use the term no stones unturned would be an understatement. From the sparring to the bags, from movement drills to strength and conditioning, the Tyson team prepared their fighter for a bigs matchup to perfection. Tyson even had time to explain in intricate detail how he overcomes height and reach advantages during the pre-fight feature on HBO. I think you know, it's to my advantage because most fighters are used to fighting opponents 6'3", 6'2", the average um, heavyweight. And I feel that I use it to my advantage because I move my head, I'm very quick, and I'm low to the ground and it's very difficult to hit me. I crouch low just to make my opponents punch down because I know where they're going to punch at because I'm, I'm down there and I'm looking at them because I'm so low and I come up, I feel it's my advantage because they can't see most of my punches coming. I get a lot of leverage from my punches and it doesn't matter if I punch up or straight or down or around, I have good leverage. Mike can detail his route to success over the bigger guys until the cows come home. But the truth of the matter is, he struggled against tall fighters his entire career. Even during his prime, his most labored victories came over the 6'5 Mitch Green and Tony Tucker and the 6'4 Bone Crusher Smith in 1987, which was honestly one of the worst heavyweight title fights from that era. Biggs was aware of the flaws and expressed during the heated press conference, he's never fought anyone like me, someone with a strong jab who can box and is not going in there just to survive. Do you think I'm gonna walk into the roundhouse punches of a guy who's 5'8"? He followed that up with the closing statement. Everyone else is counting me out. I don't feed into that. As far as him being invincible is concerned, on fight night, I'll just have to prove that wrong. Come October 16th, I'm going to shock the world. Tyson remained quiet throughout the press conference, but my God, if looks could kill. And as good as I am, I know that I, I know how good I am. You know, I owe it to myself to go out there and beat Michael Tyson like I am his dad. It's, he's made for me. Tyson. Son, son, son. Got it. He did this wrong. He did that wrong. He did the other thing wrong. And yet, people like Michael Katz, people like Larry Merchant, 
people, as I said, whose opinions I respect, are giving them a legitimate chance tonight against Tyson. What about Ray Leonard? As we mentioned earlier, the pre-fight talk centered predominantly around Big's route to victory. With the experts on hand dealing how if Terrell can put it all together, he has the tools to expose Tyson's flaws and cruise to a unanimous decision. Their tone of voice changed when the undefeated unified champ entered the ring, however. Both men looked in prime shape during their introduction. The talking was over. It was time to settle the score. To jump right on Tyrell Biggs. Three questions that Mike Tyson really has to answer. Can he cope with a clever boxer? Can he survive a heavy puncher? And can he persevere when he's hurt? I see a lot of movement on the part of uh, Tyrell Biggs. Good lateral movement. Let's throw the jab like he's doing now. Uh, Tyson also said that he has found a pattern in Tyrell Biggs that he feints to the right before the punch actually is thrown. But whatever he does, the fact that Tyson has to set up to get that kind of leverage. Whether or not Biggs can keep this up is yet to be seen. Good, consistent jab, 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 jab. He's trying for the head. Now we see seeing head, head hunting from Mike Tyson. He can get him back into the center ring, use the jab again and come with that right hand. That was a quick little overhand right by Tyrell Biggs. Biggs now is talking to Tyson. I don't know if Biggs can fight a perfect fight, but he fought about as perfect a round as he could have hoped for to start this fight. Larry Merchant was spot on. The perfect round indeed. Biggs boxed with authority while oozing confidence in his movements. The jab was landing often, the right hand found its way also. But better yet, Tyson didn't land a single blow, as the eloquent footwork saw Terrell almost float back to the center of the ring to regain position. And as Punchstat showed, or confirmed, that was a very good round, using the left hand as well as he can. The matter is the right hand is down, a big, the left hook has been scored. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. That quote should have a hyperlink that directs you to this exact moment, because as soon as that short left hand landed, Biggs gave up on everything that made the first round so successful and continued to do precisely what he said he wouldn't do in the pre-fight presser. Beautiful. Although Kevin Rooney was insistent on Mike asserting some authority with the jab, the young champ smelt blood and weakness and elected to fire spiteful individual power punches to wear Terrell down. By the end of the fourth, hopes of an upset for Biggs were pretty much dead, as Tyson dictated the action while forcing Terrell to fight at his desired pace. from your chin, though. The guy can't fight inside. Biggs became a punching bag through five and six, though at the very least displaying decent heart and resilience. Rooney had seen enough, however, and before round seven started, he gave Tyson some strict instructions to end the fight right now. Oh, that, that was a tremendous left hand. Where have we seen that face before? But unlike Razor Ruddock, Biggs was finished entirely, needing only a week left to send him crashing to the canvas again and out for the count. It's down again, it's over. It's all over. And it wasn't even close. Not often do we see a dark side of Tyson specifically in a post-fight scenario, yet he wasn't through with Biggs just yet, as he shared some personal details with Larry Merchant during his interview. Well, tell me, what, what did you think in that first round when he was moving, trying to do an Ali no, with his left? I knew when I, when I came to this fight, I was the best fighter in the world, and I'm a man alive that can beat me. What broke him down? Was it just Constantly the pressure? body punches. When I was, I was hitting him with body punches, I heard him actually, he was crying in there, making woman gestures like, oh, 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 I can't How, find yeah. him, but I knew that he was breaking down soon. After doing some research and editing back the footage for Biggs, it'd be easy to blame his managerial team for misguiding his career in terms of fighting style and the matchmaking itself. 
Yet, I think while he was a good boxer, his durability issues were always going to be his downfall. Biggs suffered knockout defeats in his next two fights before having his career truly laid to rest once he eventually met the new top dogs in Riddick Bowe and Lennox Lewis in the early 90s. To the surprise of many, Tyson's first defeat didn't come by the hands of a slick boxer, but rather a more determined puncher in Buster Douglas during their 1990 showdown in Japan. 